Welcome to The Brave Place, where we journey into the lives of brave men and women who have beat the odds or who are in the trenches right now. Difference makers who have truly discovered the warrior that lives within and are living it out. This is the place that will inspire, encourage, enlighten, and challenge that brave person that lives deep down within all of us. And welcome back to The Brave Place. I'm your host, Christy Rodriguez. Today we are here with one of my favorite people on the planet. She is just doing some huge things for our community and helping victims of human trafficking. That's what we're talking about today. Parental discretion is advised. Um, We want you to stay tuned, though, because this is about protecting our little people and ourselves and our communities. And with me today is Jenny Sori. She's the founder of Hub of Hope, which is a an amazing nonprofit organization in Northwest Arkansas, and they're just doing awesome things. So Jenny, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me, Christy. It's, it is a hard topic. I'm just so blessed that you have chosen to have us here today to talk to our community about this. Girl, I wouldn't have it any other way. You're an expert on this, and I can't wait to, to dive in because I think everybody needs to hear what we're talking about today. And I just want to read off a few stats about human trafficking. Number one, it's the fastest growing criminal industry in the world. Each year, the human trafficking industry makes an estimated $150 billion. The average age of entry in the U.S. into sex trafficking is 12 to 14 years old. And, and we are going to define human trafficking here in a minute. Um, most people have an idea of what it is, but I want to get a clear definition and understanding for all our listeners. Of the people enslaved in sexual exploitation, 98% are female, 2% are male, 46% of people know their trafficker or recruiter prior to being trafficked. And what we're going to talk about that too, um, the grooming process, right? An estimated one out of six runaways are likely child trafficking victims. And on any given night, this this is astounding to me, on any given night, 41,000 unaccompanied youth ages 13 to 25 will experience homelessness. It affects people of any ethnicity, race, religion, age, and socioeconomic status. So Jenny, tell me, what is human trafficking? Let's let's define that first. Well, actually, Christy, it's interesting because a lot of people believe that they understand what human trafficking is. Um, it it has a very distinct definition, however. It's a long one. We probably won't have time to go over all of that today. Um, but it was put out in the year 2000 under the Trafficking of Victims Protection Act. And to really kind of just sum it up, it is people selling people. Mm. It's the use of an individual for either labor or for sex in exchange for something of value. And so a lot of people believe that you have to um, actually cross a border um, for that to happen, that there is some type of maybe smuggling involved, but it literally can just be the receipt of an individual. So really, it's people selling people. Mm. I know there are different forms of human trafficking. So um, we see um, labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Um, There's also organ trafficking. And we Mm. think that these are things that happen so far across the ocean, and they do. uh, But they're also happening right here in the United States. We deal mostly with um, sex trafficking and mainly adult women survivors of trafficking under our victim response. But we do speak about all forms of trafficking in, in really hopes of prevention. Can you give me some examples just locally? We're, we are in northwest Arkansas, and human trafficking is definitely happening right here, um, right in front of us. So how can we as a community be aware of signs around us? There are distinct markers and identifiers, and You know, those won't always be in place. You're not going to see all of them at one time. And just because um, someone maybe recognizes a marker and identifier that we talk about doesn't mean that that person is a survivor of trafficking. But some of the things that we look for... Can I tell you in a little story, Christy? Yeah. Okay. So we, I was actually at a serving. Um, it was in a low-income area of, of our, our community. And while I was there, I was at the front of the serving line, and I saw a man and woman approach the table. And the man had his 
hand on the back of the woman's neck. My, my nanny always said at the scruff of the neck, you know, it's a mm. very um, strong hold. Kind of controlling. Type. It is. It's a controlling yeah. hold. Her eyes were downcast. She never looked up at me. They approached the table. I said, would y'all like to have some salad tonight? We're having salad and chicken. We're having some green beans and bread and dessert, but how about some salad? She would never looked at me. She never spoke. And he spoke for her and said, she doesn't eat that. Mm. I said, okay, how about some chicken or green beans? And he said, she's not going to have any of that. She's going to have bread and she's going to have dessert. And so, of course, those are all red flags. He's speaking for her. Her eyes are downcast. Um, as they turned away from the table, he actually had pulled her his hand down to the the back of her, um, right at the at the back, and um, it exposed her neck. And on her neck was a tattooed barcode. Oh my goodness! Yeah. So we look for all those things. So you saw, you know, the downcast eyes, her not speaking, him controlling her, and then also what we call branding, and it's very common. It's an age-old tradition of slavery, um, but traffickers still brand what they believe is their property today. Wow. Well, obviously, just listening to that, she has several signs of human trafficking, and and I do want to cover that really quickly. Just some signs we can look for, and then I want you to tell me what someone can do when they see those signs. So let me read off a few here. Appears unreasonably fearful or anxious at the mention of law enforcement. Appears to be timid or afraid in the presence of a companion. Uh, Signs of abuse, unkeptness, addiction, nervousness. Answers appear to be scripted. Um, Does not want to say where they are staying or where they are from. They lack personal possessions. They have an unstable living situation. Maybe they live at the same place where they work. Um, There's a deep sadness or visible anger, signs of hostility and frustration. Uh, They avoid eye contact. Um, ID documents are a problem or an issue. Owner branding tattoo um, has in possession items of value that he or she cannot afford. So those are several signs. And just in the story you just shared, that woman, she has several of those. Mm -hmm. So if I am in public and I, and I'm checking that out, um, and perfect situation, if I'm at a soup kitchen and I'm serving soup and I see that situation, what do I need to do about it? Well, first of all, let me just tell you that none of us are Wonder Woman, that we're just not. She's my favorite superhero, but we're not Wonder Woman. And so rescue really is not what we do. Um, We have to be very careful, even though we want to just dive right in and do something about it in that moment. We have to understand that because she is monitored um, or he is monitored. I mean, this could also be a male victim as well. And so just because that person, you know, uh, looks like he or she may be a victim, we cannot just rush right in. Um, And so if that individual is in the presence of someone you believe is their trafficker, uh, the best thing that you can do is for you yourself to call the National Human Trafficking Hotline and report what you've seen. You can also call local law enforcement. If you're in the presence of something happening and it's an emergency, call 911. Now, if there happens to be a chance that you can get that person um, aside, you know, and you have an opportunity to be with them alone, away from their trafficker, uh, then it's always okay just to ask, are you safe? And there have been many opportunities where we've had, you know, a chance to do that. We actually have little what we call bra cards or shoe cards. And on it, it just has a question um, that kind of leads them to wonder if it actually notes some of those markers and identifiers in question form. Is someone holding your documentation? You know, are you being forced to do things that you don't want to do? Is someone uh, paying someone else for services that you're performing? And then it has the National Human Trafficking Hotline on it. And if we're here local. We hand out the ones that have our own Hub of Hope helpline on it. And so really that's some of the main things you can do. But if you have an opportunity um, that if you know this individual, build relationship. You know, I think sometimes we think this is they over there and this is us, but these are people in our community, the people we live with and walk with and do life with. And we're, we're called to build relationships with these individuals. Wow. Have you ever had a situation where you've been alone with a woman and had that moment where you say, are you safe? Yes, very much so. Yes. We've had the opportunity um, to be able to actually in that moment, ask her these questions. Um, She, uh, this particular individual was living homeless. She had been actually brought here from another state tons of red flags, um, just trying to build rapport and relationship with her in a two hour time frame. She revealed that her 
boyfriend, the listeners can't see it, but it's air quote, boyfriend, brought her here from another state, and he was actually selling her out of um, a local laundromat here in the area. And um, we were able to, you know, help her get somewhere safe that night, Um, some food, some clothing from all of our coalition partners that we're so grateful for here in our community, and then be able to get her back home to her family two days later. Wow. And so I want to talk about that. When you say we were able to, we being Hub of Hope. And I just love the name Hub of Hope because that's truly what you guys are. You you bring this place of hope for anyone that is suffering from human trafficking. And so what do you do? What services do you, does Hub of Hope provide for these victims? Our mission statement is we work to bring healing and opportunities to victims of human trafficking and provide prevention and education to the community. And if you listen closely, that is the H- O-P-E, Healing, Opportunities, Prevention, and Education. And so we actually do that um, under kind of what we call two arms. One of those is our victim service arm where we answer a helpline that is available to anyone who feels like they're in the presence of a potential victim or a victim themselves. Um, We also have a victim response team. And um, they actually go out to meet those potential survivors when we actually get a call from the helpline or from one of our coalition partners. We have a relocation and a safe transport team. And so um, we're able to actually go pick up that individual from the place that they're at and take them to a safe place. We have what we call the hub staff team, and we were remotely operating, but in 2019, we were actually able to secure what we call the hub, and it works as an office for us, a place for us to meet uh, with our survivors and as a team, but it also provides a 72-hour crisis center. And so when we have someone who doesn't have an immediate safe place, we're able to bring them there, give them a place to rest, a place to eat and then we work on next step plans for them and so um, we also have a hope advocacy team and it's just kind of a way of saying a mentor and so it's individuals who will walk that path of restoration and healing with that survivor and then we have what's called a survivor support group because I don't know if you're like me but when you've been through something sometimes you just feel like I must be the only one feeling Mm -hmm. like this and Mm -hmm. so many of the survivors we work with that's exactly how they feel and they said it would be so nice to be able to come together with other survivors and who've experienced the same things that I have. And so that's what Survivor Support Group is all about. And then we have a prevention and education arm uh, where we do outreach. We have a team that goes into detention centers and uh, just provide conversation about human trafficking. And it's so important because many of those um, individuals that we speak with um, who actually are victims don't recognize themselves as a victim of a crime. And so that SEEDS team is so important. And then lots of education and awareness. And we have a Parents Against Child Trafficking initiative who actually helps support parents um, to have those crucial conversations of prevention with their children. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that is so powerful. What strikes me is the manipulation involved with the trafficker. It's so true, Christy, because many of the individuals that we work with, you know, they have been taught, and some from a very young age, abuse happening very young in their lives while their brain is still developing, right? And so they have been made to believe that this is the life that they deserve and so much shame and so much guilt. And so that's part of the tactic of a trafficker is making that individual, that victim, believe that this is her or his value or worth. And um, really the incidents that we work with, the type of trafficking we work with mostly is sex trafficking. And if I'm okay to say this, what we're talking about is forced prostitution. Mm. The trafficker, who is a pimp, um, begins to uh, build relationship with this individual. Um, They will create great trauma bonds. And I don't know if you know much about trauma bond, but that victim will believe that they are in relationship with this trafficker. Um, They want to do the things to make that trafficker continue to love them. Um, Although we know it's not real love, it is empty love is what we call that. And so he will, um, in the the grooming process of that, um, he will buy her nice things. Uh, He will take her out to eat at nice dinners. Uh, They will rack up a lot of credit. And um, what happens over time is he will begin to isolate her from those people that truly are her support group. Um, Oftentimes lots of abuse, addiction happens, and so that's a huge tactic is to get his victim um, a 
addicted to a substance where she has to continue to come back to him for that. Um, over time, during that grooming process, the, the tides will turn, and um, he will actually say, if we want this life together that we've always wanted, now you have to help us, you have to help me pay back that debt that we've been, you know. Mm. Just creating this incredible dependency. In incredible dependency. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. But it begins with what looks like love and true affection and attention. Um, but then it moves into really revealing itself. But many of those uh, survivors are so attached to that trafficker because of those trauma bonds that it's very hard to break away from that. And so, I mean, we have had uh, some clients that actually work very reputable, beautiful jobs during the week, but that are actually trafficked on the weekends by their boyfriend. Unbelievable. And so for them to actually understand that this is a crime against them, um, is a huge realization, and it's the first step for them to be able to actually recognize that there can be freedom and healing and restoration. There is someone listening who is caught in human trafficking, and what would you tell that person? What would be the bravest thing they can do right now? It's not always easy to um, attempt that fleeing, um, but I would say that as an encouragement, there are people who understand they see you, and that there is hope. And we say that always. We are about hope. There is hope. And so um, we say call. Call that helpline. Be able to reach out to somebody that you trust, that there is hope for that. There is freedom. There is restoration. That you are a precious, precious gift, and that the Lord has designed a purpose for you. What you've experienced so far, this victimization is not your worth and your value. That there really is not, a price cannot be placed on you. Um, you are priceless and a creation of God. And so um, we just speak hope. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to talk about PACT, um, which is Parents Against Child Trafficking. And, and I want to talk about how we can protect our kids. Right. So Parents Against Child Trafficking is an initiative we, that um, we umbrella, Hub of Hope umbrellas that, and so we support that initiative. It's actually run by Barbara Gregory, and she developed that particular initiative, and she, is, as a mother herself, wanted to provide prevention, you know, for her own daughter in her home. As she began to learn about human trafficking, she thought to herself, that could be my daughter. That could be anybody's daughter that this happens to. Um, one of the things that, that we talk about when we, when we introduce PACT and we talk about prevention is that it's no longer about really just abduction, somebody coming in and stealing our children, but it's about our children choosing to walk out of our homes into the hands of a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And that is why Parents Against Child Trafficking exists, is to equip parents to be able to have those discussions with their children to provide that prevention and to really develop good, healthy bonds in their home so that children can turn to their parents in times when they recognize things are just not right. Mm -hmm. Education, education, education. When we know better, we do better, right? That's right. That's all right. So when someone's grooming a child, what does that look like? Really, sometimes it's very much the same um, because that grooming process is all about building some type of relationship. That trafficker takes that time to build that relationship. That trust. That trust, exactly. And vulnerability is so high in those young years. And so remembering that... Um, human trafficking is exploitation of vulnerability. And so it's been a long time since I've been a teenager, but I work around them. I see them. You see the vulnerability. What is it that a, that a teenager wants or a young child wants? They want love and acceptance, um, especially as they reach those teen years. They want someone to say how beautiful they are. Um, they want them to actually accept their hopes and their dreams and some of the things that they want to be. They want to be a movie star. That's what everybody wants to be, or a singer. And a trafficker knows that, and they will latch on to feeding them all of those positive things that or sound positive to that, that young person. And so it, that is truly one of the highest tactics of a trafficker. And a lot of that happens online. I, I was going to go there. Um, tell, me, tell me about online targeting. So you know, I love social media. It helps me to speak to my friends all over the world. And I, I even love Snapchat. I love the little dog face and my granddaughter <laughs> and I, you know, like to send those things uh, back and forth to one another. And um, 
But we have to also recognize that traffickers understand that young people are utilizing those apps on our phones. And so they'll look at everything that is posted about the person that they're targeting. And we're so free to just post where we're at and our new car and the job we have or, you know, pictures of our own children on there. Um, Traffickers use all of that. And especially young people who post things on social media, um, they will latch on. They'll look at who their friends are. So they will try to build that rapport. And so they will say, oh, I see your friends with so-and-so, and and that heightens some trust, right? Mm -hmm. Or you looked so beautiful in your last picture. You know, where did you get that dress? That will give off the area that they're shopping and living and moving in. And so we have to be so careful because once we post something, it is out there. And the thought that, you know, forever people thought that, like, on Snapchat, things just disappeared. They don't. Mm. Anybody can get to that information, which we're very grateful for with some of our law enforcement officers we work with. But it's out there for anybody to see. Mm-hmm. Well, and and it's interesting, just those, those smooth little sly questions. You know, where did you get that dress? You know, what movie did you see? You know, where did you go see that movie? Yes. Just, just to find those locations. You'll hear parents say, you know, my, my child has a right to their privacy. They're becoming an adult. They're a teenager. And then you have parents who say, I don't think so. That phone belongs to me. I pay for that phone, and I will be checking out that phone as much as I want. What What are your thoughts on that? Well, I was one to say, I paid for the phone. I will look at the phone. <laughs> but there's no law that restricts us from either way, and everybody has a choice. You know, we're talking about an issue that we know, we have evidence of um, individuals who – took advantage of people posting things on those phones. And so we're going to speak to say, if you choose not to always look on there, I would say look when you get an opportunity to look, but do it together. Mm -hmm. You know, don't put up a brick wall. But from even if you can start it at a young age, the first time when you give that phone, make sure that they understand how to use that phone. Let encourage them not in a disciplinary way, but encourage them that we're going to use this together so that we all stay safe in this because it's a great tool. We love to be able to use it. And you're going to have so many fun things that you're going to get to do with this phone, but let's do it together and set up what you're going to do. What are the rules for using that phone? I was an early childhood educator for years and I actually had a school here in Benton County. And I always like, I hated getting that envelope of hair on my desk. Mm. Any teachers will know that teachers of early childhood children will understand this. It meant that somebody cut their own hair with scissors, right? (laughs) And I would have to send that home. And the conversation was, we should introduce those scissors before we just set them out on the table, right? And so we think about those things, but what about these cellular devices? Oftentimes, out of convenience, we give it to them so they can call us when they're done with a practice or a rehearsal of some kind. And we have to train and teach them. And go online. Our Parents Against Child Trafficking Initiative actually has a great website to look at the apps, um, discuss them with your children. What is that website? Right, so you can visit our website at parentsagainstchildtrafficking.org. And it, it changes because apps come and apps go. And so, uh, but it should be some good information for parents. And here's what that website does and what this organization does is it, it helps you recognize the warning signs, understand the tactics of child predators, reduce a child's vulnerability, strengthen relationships, and put protective measures in place. Who doesn't want that? We That's need right. that for our kids. That's right. One thing, too, that I think that you do that is just so, so important is just the education piece. The best way to conquer your enemy, right, is to know your enemy and and to understand how your enemy works and moves. And, and you do that by going throughout our community. Where are you doing this education? Yeah, we have a little hashtag that we use oftentimes. Well, we use three of them, Hub of Hope NWA. Live to Lean In, and then our third one is Awareness Fuels Rescue, and we believe that wholeheartedly. Um, I actually, we have stories of people that we have taught these markers and identifiers that we've talked about today. They have recognized it. They have called our helpline, and we actually are able to move in and to assist that survivor to move to safety, and so we believe education is so, so important. So we actually provide um, two times a year our own training. It's actually a long one. It's an eight-hour 
hour training. It's two days. And so we love to be able to just really educate deeply. So we go into all the things we've shared today, but on a deeper level. But we also invited in to churches, uh, community groups, small Bible studies. In the state of Arkansas now, there was a legislation passed that every teacher has to have at least 30 minutes of in-service every year regarding human trafficking. And so we have been asked in to many schools in our area to be able to have that discussion with teachers. We've also had conversations with students in those populations as well. And we love, love, love that opportunity. Uh, We do a medical training because we have to realize that many people in the medical field get an opportunity to see things and to be able to have conversations that with a potential survivor that nobody else will be able to have. And so we have that training, um, also training law enforcement, uh, school counselors. And so we look for any opportunity to dive into those conversations. That's amazing. And those two, you know, the two eight-hour days you were talking about, is is that open free to the community? It is open to anyone. Um, we do have a little charge on that just because, again, we're an all-volunteer organization and we want to have good sustainability and health and longevity, but it is open to anyone in the public. We would love it. Awesome. So how can people find you? So Hub of Hope is accessible via our uh, web space. We're at hubofhope.org. Uh, we can also be reached by email at hubofhopenwa at gmail.com. And we also can be reached by phone. So our number is 479 640 Zero zero two two, and if you feel like you're in the presence of a potential survivor, our helpline is one four zero five five eight two zero seven five nine, and we try to answer that twenty four seven. But doesn't always happen. But we welcome people to call. Well, what you're doing, Jenny, is just such an impactful movement within our community. There's so much more awareness now in Northwest Arkansas than ever before. And if we could just have Jenny's everywhere and all these different locations across the country, we could truly change the landscape of human trafficking and fight it like never before. And I just want to say thank you for everything that you're doing, for stepping up and saying, yes, Lord, I will do this and I will lead the charge because it truly has made such a difference. And I know in our community and, and it's just spilling out throughout the world because all the people that you're educating, that goes to the next person and that goes to the next person. So just thank you. You're so welcome. And I just, I just want to tell you, Christy, also that, you know, I think that it would be really good for the community to understand that it's not just a calling for one person or one organization, but it's a calling for all of us. At Hub of Hope, we say live to lean in. And that came to me. I was overseas. I was approaching the train. I love to ride the train. We need a good train system where we just <laughs> pop on the train. But, you know, it in this beautiful voice, you know, it comes over the intercom and it says, mind the gap between the train and the platform in a much more beautiful tone than what I just gave you. <laughs> That's pretty and good. And I thought to myself, what does it mean to mind the gap? What is the gap? And of course, I'm looking down into the gap and it's a big space that the train is going to take up when it approaches the station. And it says to mind it, be careful of the gap. And I thought, why would I need to be careful of it? Well, if you've ever looked into the gap at the train station, it is dark. It is dirty. There are things moving in there that I could probably, I really couldn't identify. If I fell in, I would be exhausted trying to get out. And what I believe is the Holy Spirit in a still small voice, he said, Jenny, What if instead of minding the gap, I call you to stand in the gap Mm -hmm. for the vulnerable and the oppressed that live all around you and to be a voice to encourage others that that is what we as believers, as Christians are called to do is to lean in. So that's why we say live to lean in instead of scurrying around a person that's not like us or because we don't really know about that. We kind of shove that into that place of out of sight, out of mind. Why don't we lean into that? What a beautiful, beautiful community we would be if we just encouraged living to lean in. Wow. Those are powerful words. Well, you are definitely on a brave journey. And when I think of brave, you definitely come to my mind. And and thank you so much for joining me today. I, I hope that today's podcast will bring awareness to our community and beyond and and that more people will reach out whenever they need help or when they see warning signs. And if you do have any questions about what Jenny talked about today, please do not hesitate to check out her website, send her an email, call, 
uh, the helpline that she shared. And you can always email me at christy at thebraveplace.org. And Christy is spelled C-H-R-I-S-T-Y at thebraveplace.org. Thank you again, Jenny. I've loved having you. It's always good to see you and chat with you. Any final words to our listeners? Well, I would just say that I wish I was the person that had butterflies and blooms and balloons, and we just talked about all happy things. (laughs) Um, But it's a hard, it's a hard topic. It is a dark topic, but I just appreciate the opportunity to share and for the listeners who've listened today and to know and remember that we do live in victory and that all of those survivors that we talked about, so many of them are living in restoration and healing. There is restoration and healing. And it comes mainly through Jesus. Amen. Before we go today, I want to leave you with a final brave word and challenge in a clip of our next podcast. Also, if you enjoy our podcast here at The Brave Place, please subscribe, rate us, hopefully five stars, and leave a comment. It helps us know how much we're making an impact, plus lets you know as soon as a new episode comes out. And now for the final brave word and challenge, I just want to say that Jenny's hashtag live to lean in takes me to a powerful moment in scripture when Jesus was asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, he said. And then he said, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law hangs on these two commandments. That was in Matthew twenty two thirty six through 40. The two greatest commandments are all about leaning in, leaning into God first and then to our neighbors. We see that being played out so beautifully in Jenny's story with Hub of Hope as she has chosen to lean into God and others. And as a result, it's changing lives everywhere. So often we get caught up in the busyness and it's easy to do because we have distractions like never before, endless amounts of information at our fingertips, consuming our time, and we forget to lean into anything else really. But I can assure you with utmost certainty, he's calling you. He's calling you to himself and he's calling you to help others. His entire law hangs on that. So my challenge for you today is this, get honest with yourself about what you're really leaning into. Are you leaning into God and others, or are you distracted by the many different distractions we can easily be pulled into? God wants to speak to you. He wants to work miracles through you, and I can promise you it's such a sweeter place than the distractions the world has to offer. Let's set up an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to do an incredible work in and through us. Hashtag live to lean in. That's your brave word and challenge today. And finally, I want to leave you with a clip from our next podcast where we meet up with a dear friend of mine, Tamara Picasso. She's going to take us down her own personal journey of infidelity in her marriage and how turning to God opened doors she never thought were possible. Take a listen. To be honest, there were multiple times in the six months that I just would wake up from this numbness. That's the only way I know how to describe it. I would wake up from this numbness and just break down and feel like, what have I done? Be sure and tune in. You'll love Tamara and what God has done in her life and in her marriage. It's quite a story. Thank you again for spending your time with us today. And until next time, have a brave day. Thanks for listening to The Brave Place, part of the KLRC Podcast Network. 